Tonight we'll be in the 5th through the 8th verses of chapter 6. This will be our 74th installment. I've called this Practical Submission number 3. Now I've emphasized, as you know, that spiritual life cannot be compartmentalized. Now I thought, well, I better maybe better explain what we mean by compartmentalized. Now the houses you live in, this is particularly for younger people, the houses you live in have different rooms. That's compartmentalized, different rooms. But in the, in the kingdom of God, there's not a lot of different rooms. It's like your house has one big room. <laughs> and everything is done in that room. That room is a room devoted to God, devoted to the Lord. And whether you're cooking in the kitchen or you're sleeping in the bed, you're in that room and everything's done unto God. So that's, that's what we mean when we say life's not compartmentalized. No part of life is lived for God and then another part for you. It's not that this shouldn't be done, it's that it can't be done. It's impossible for you to serve God and you. It, either you serve God and let Him take care of you or you're out of the picture. That's, that's the way it is. I think we need to really speak candidly about this. See, salvation is calculated to change the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. As long as you're in the world, your body's not changed yet. You've got to manage it. You've got to manage it. Now, when you're a toddler, your parents manage it for you. You become of age. You've got to manage your body because it's your enemy. Your body's your enemy. The world will teach you to worship your body. Well, they will. They'll have beauty contests. They'll have strength contests. <laughs> that stress the body. See, are you against those things? Well, I wouldn't say I'm against them. It's just like, so what? You can be super strong and lose your strength in the day and lose your eyes too. So while we remain in the world, the transformation of the body hasn't taken place, and so that's why it has to be, mm -hmm. has to be managed. It will be transformed to the resurrection, the day of the resurrection, when mortality swallows up immortality. Uh, when immortality swallows up mortality, yeah. or we put on. At the resurrection, you'll put on immortality. When you're born into the world, you put on mortality. <laughs> Every baby that's born puts on yeah, that's right. mortality yeah. as soon as it comes out of the womb. So we're in fact being, being oriented for the world to come. As we're going to school, that's actually what's, actually what's happening. And there's going to be no competing influences there, so we won't have to have exhortations like we do here. There'll be no weaknesses, anything like that. But here, there are. Now that time, is called, Jesus called it the regeneration. Yeah. That's what he, the regeneration. Yeah. When the heavens and the earth are going to be regenerated, yeah. and your bodies are going to be regenerated. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're living for that time. Yeah. And I, all these things we've been reading about in Ephesians, about human conduct, is in view of that view of those stark realities. Now this, this has been a very difficult thing for the modern church to receive. If it's not impossible that we're being oriented for another world, that this world's not really the real world. And so Babylon the Great, which is Satan's a, attempt to fabricate a church that looks like the real thing, Babylon the Great has convinced the world that it's all right to adapt to this world. And then they've created a whole bunch of programs to solve the problems that are created by doing that. <laughs> They're like in the computing world. 
there are people that write viruses and then they write software to get rid of the viruses. Yeah, right, yeah. Oh, yeah. This has been doing this for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what Babylon does. Babylon creates an erroneous, an erroneous religion, then creates all kind of programs to solve the problems that that erroneous religion has caused. Uh -huh. So Paul's taking the most common classifications of life, wives, husbands, children, fathers, servants, masters. That's about as, that's kind of down here at the first. And he's saying they all got to be lived for God. Yeah. Every one of them. So a spiritual skill, he's teaching us how to live. With salvation in mind and with eternity in mind. So now we're in chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of heart. Of your in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Servants. I say we're talking now about servants. Other versions say bond servants. As you're owned by somebody else. Or slaves or bond men. The definition of a servant, as used in the Bible, is this. It's as follows. It's a slave, a bondman. It's a man of servile condition, one who gives himself to another's will, <coughs> devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests, an attendant, which means someone else, he's operating by someone else's agenda. Now you ought to be able to kind of pick up on that. Now, from of old time, there's always been servants or slaves. Referred to as bond servants in scripture. Abraham and Sarah had slaves. Yeah. Hagar was Sarah's slave. Eliezer and a whole host of others were Abraham's slaves. Joseph was a slave when he was sold by his brothers. And when he grew up, he had slaves. Moses in the law told people how to handle slaves. You couldn't be rough with them. You had to be fair with them. Ever so often they are released. The priests of old, they had slaves. See, I'm, there's been a bad connotation put to the word slaves, and it, I, can't, I think it's gone overboard a little yeah. bit. <clears throat> David had servants or slaves. Cornelius had servants or slaves. Onesimus was a slave of Philemon to whom Paul wrote a letter and sent Onesimus back to his master and told Philemon to receive him back as a brother in Christ because he'd been converted since he, he ran away. He was a runaway slave. <coughs> and Paul didn't say, well, you can... You should never have been a slave on Isthmus. You got a lot of ability. You, you have a right to be free. Life, liberty is a pursuit of happiness. That's what God wants for you. No, he sent him back to Philemon. I'm sorry. So now Paul gives special instruction to slaves or bond servants. Now it's not our practice in our country to have slaves, but the definition fits employee very well. They fall in the category of one who gives himself to another's will. That's an employee. That's what they do. Devoted to another without regard for one's interests. That's what an employee does. 
In our case, an employee is someone who sold his time. Whoever you got a job from, you sold him your time. At least a segment of it. Some, you sold him eight hours a day, five days a week. You sold. You actually bartered, you exchanged your time for their money. That's what, it's what a slave does. <laughs> Serves the interests of another. Now, some people don't think of it this way, but that's the way it is. That's why if you're a bad employee, this doesn't speak well for God at all because you're the one that struck up the agreement. You're the one that said you'd sell him your time. You're the one that said when he needed it, you'd be there. It's a covenant, covenant that was made. So I'm saying this text applies to that kind of situation. There were servants of old, mentioned in Leviticus 25, 47, who sold themselves. So that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about an employee. You sold yourself. You went out and said, I got, uh, I'm without work, so I got this all this time on my hand. And I, I don't, I'm not really making anything, so I'm willing to sell some of my time to you. In fact, I'll sell myself to you. And I'll work for you, and I'll do what you want, and I'll do your interest. See, no one will employ you until you do this. Right? You wouldn't go out and have a job and say, I'm going to tell you right up front, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be a witness, and I'm going to be witnessing out on the floor about Jesus because I'm a servant of Jesus. And if I was an employee, then I'd say, well, then you go right ahead, but you won't get paid. Yeah. I'm showing you, he's going to address this thing straight on. So it's very important to see. And some servants not only sold themselves, some servants who were given opportunity to be free could elect to stay with their master and not leave. So I'll approach this text as with willing servitude in mind, an employee-employer relationship. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. In other words, and say, obey your earthly masters, or obey your human masters, or be obedient to those who are your physical masters. Now, being obedient, everybody knows what that means. But a lot of people with jobs gripe about it an awful lot, complain about what they're told to do, not because it's immoral or ungodly, they just don't like it. I'd rather work at the air conditioning, thank you. Be obedient. Means you made this agreement to sell your time, do what you're told. It's good to people to learn this, and young people to learn it when they're young, and some adults never did learn it yet. Yeah. It's just good to be obedient now. It may be something he tells you not to do, it may be something he tells you to do, but be obedient to your earthly master, to your earthly master, see? I'm going to tell you why as you proceed. Task may not be pleasant, and the servant might really prefer to do something else, but actually you learn a lot about living for God on the job. Amen. I can tell you this, I learned this firsthand. You learn a lot about your obedience to God by your job. Sometimes you're asked to do things, and, oh no, not me. Well, God does the same thing. Sometimes the first reaction is, I don't know. It can be pretty hard to do that, Lord, because I love my, I love Aunt Jody so much. I don't know if I can. But she's ungodly, and an ungodly influence on me, and I just love her. I love my Aunt Jody so much. I don't know, Lord, if I if I can forsake her for you. Oh, yes. See, don't, they don't actually say this, but this is what they're thinking. And sometimes it's closer than Aunt Jody. Potiphar's wife, for example, was over Joseph. And she gave Joseph a command. Lie with me. Yeah. All right, Joseph, what are you going to do? Well, that, now that's the kind of command I can't obey because I've... No, God forbid, I can't. <laughs> I can't do this. 
even though she was over him. See, so this, when we're talking about obedience, we're talking about, we're not talking about a commandment to do something that God has forbidden you to do. We're not talking about that kind of thing at all. The three Hebrew children were commanded by Nebuchadnezzar, who was over them. They were his servants. Bow down before this idol I made. They said, we're not going to do it. So when we say be obedient to them, we're talking about the commandments are within the scope of the will of God, and they're, they're not immoral, and they're not ungodly. You just obey them, and well, he goes further than that. He says, with fear and trembling, with fear and trembling. I mean, this is a free country, isn't it? With fear and trembling, that's what he said. Amen. With fear and trembling. Some verses tone it down, respect and fear. The idea is that the very thought of not carrying out what's required makes scares you. Now, see, we have nice employers for the most part in our country, but see, <laughs> this isn't true of every country. Some countries you do fear and tremble. You're told to do something, you don't do it. With fear and trembling, you're going to explain why. It's not because you fear and tremble him. Right? At the one who's over you, earthly master. It's not because you fear him or tremble because of him. Because this time we're talking about something God has told us to do. Yeah. Do it fear and trembling in singleness of heart. Remember this one room thing? You're living for God. You're working because you're serving God. God may have set you the dung gate to take something out. He may set you the water gate to bring something in. Where he's put you in, in life, that's his business. That's not ours. But I can tell you, I've learned by experience, God will give you a job that will best train you for his kingdom. And sometimes it will require that you have a terrible boss. Because he knows you got too much of self in you. So he's going to get it out of you by making you do things you don't want to do. And if you don't do it, you know you don't get a check. And if you don't get a check, you can't provide for your families. Well, I'm going to knuckle down and do it. But see, that's training you. Not to filter what God requires through your affection and feeling first. Don't filter through that. Just the fact that God said, do it, do it, and it'll train you how to do this yeah. from your master. <laughs> Singleness of heart. The believer knows he's been bought with a price. He's not his own. How can I complain about where God's put me? He bought me. I belong to him. I don't belong to anybody else. I belong to him. And so I'm going to take this as God telling me to do this. Amen. My steps are ordered by the Lord. So I ended up on this employment, whatever I may think about it. I've got no choice if I've, if I've been living by faith. I've got no choice but to say, God ordered my steps. So here's where I am. Singles of heart as unto, the, as unto Christ. So our heart's affection is for Christ. We've connected. The servant has connected his master, his human master, with the Christ. Yeah, yeah. How's, how's that? Yeah, yeah. Hey, have you learned to do this? Some people live for a long time. They never really learned to, learn to make this connection. This is the voice of my Christ directed me. Maybe I'll understand it more fully as time passes. The truth of the matter is Christ died for all that they which live should from henceforth from the time they're saved on not live unto themselves but unto him was died for them and rose again. So can you connect servant? Can you connect your master with that? God, Paul calls upon you to do so. Make the connection. This is true of wives submitting to their husbands. It's true of husbands caring for their wives and children obey their parents and fathers rearing their children and servants obeying their masters. They're all to make the connection with Christ. Yes, 
Life is to be lived for Christ, no matter where you are. It is to be lived for Christ. If you're a student and you're in the public school system, you got to be a student for Christ. You can't be causing trouble and being the troublemaker and things like this. Or even in a home school, if you've got a big family, one might, you know, we all have had a little experience here. You might have one that kind of wants their own way. I'm no. No. It's not allowed. All these relationships we've talked about are connected with Christ. Amen. As unto Christ. Means the response of the servants is to their masters mm -hmm. is to be like their response to Christ himself. So they've got to make the connection between what they're doing yeah. and Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So if a person's working at an unlawful job like in a brothel, mm -hmm. you, you just got to quit your job. That, yeah. That's all. Yeah. You're working down there in a the bar serving drinks. You can't, you can't do this as under Christ. So you have no alternative but to quit the job. Get out of there. Well, let's, let's put it down. Let's bring it down a little bit lower. The service that's rendered is to be considered service to Christ. So if you keep a house, keep it so you wouldn't be ashamed of Jesus living there. Huh? That's what it comes down to. Yeah. So if you're fixing a meal, fix a meal for Jesus. Yeah. Would you be willing to give him what you give your family? <laughs> I don't want to get too personal, but it is that personal. When you carry out the mandates of your supervisor, do you in, do it in the attitude of obeying Jesus? Well, I'll be glad when this gets over. Actually, this is actually a most wonderful arrangement. It takes a lot of complication out of life. Yeah. Yeah. Now all you have to decide is whether the thing I've been asked to do is against the will of God or not. Mm -hmm. So you've got this single filter. You don't have to pass it through. Is it convenient? Is, do I like it? Is it conducive to my career? Or, you don't have to sift it through anything like that. You just as unto Christ. Yeah. Not resisting the powers. That's right. Because all the powers that be are actually mandated by God. That's right. What's excellent about this arrangement is you may do an excellent job and your master not note it or forget it. But the Lord won't. He's not unrighteous to forget your labor of love and work of faith. So he'll remember it whether anybody else did or not. So actually, it's a very good arrangement. All right, now not, don't do it with eye service. Eye service, or to win the favor. One version says to win the favor, win their favor when their eye is on you, or not only when you're being watched, or not only under the master's eye. There are servants <laughs> who master the art of looking busy when the boss is around. I mean, you've all worked with people like this, I'm sure. It's like an art. Eye service. They're actually slothful and indolent and neglectful, but whenever the master comes around, they're looking busy all the time. I used to work for a man, he was a president of a Bible college. Whenever you come into his office, he looked busy. He had a pad, 14 inch legal pad on his desk, and a wooden pencil there, and he was sitting there like this. Nothing was ever on the paper. He had mastered the art of looking busy. I had a man that worked for me. Danny Byrne was his name. I still remember him. He was a production supervisor. Every time you saw Danny Byrne, he was walking around with this rolled up paper in his hand. And I suspected there wasn't anything to it. I says, Danny, what's in that paper? Oh, nothing, nothing given, nothing's in there. He says, I just do that so I look busy all the time. Listen, he's not the only person that's done that. 
I service is when you calculate, you, you time what you do, you time it. So it's just a scene at the right time. Whether the work is done or not isn't really the point. Now men make allowances for people like this. Sometimes they actually end up on the top of the heap. And you'll wonder, well, well that's, that's carnality, that's the world, that's the world system. They're, they're, they're impressed with uh, things like that, but servant of God can't yield to it. See, the eyes of the Lord are over all his works. The, the earthly master, he just turns up once in a while. But the Lord's eyes are always, <laughs> always upon the person. He weighs their spirits and ponders their doings, looks on their heart. His eyes are always upon us, so that's why don't be thinking when you're working, don't be thinking about your boss only. Be thinking about the Lord's watching. Not with eyes of not men pleasers. Not as men pleasers. Yes. Well, just to comment on that, what you're talking about, eye service there, we do work with people like this, and <laughs> there's so, this is so frequent that sometimes when it's someone really important, like one of the head you know, people in the company, they'll actually send messages out there that everyone's saying, hey, these people are coming and checking. You better be on your best behavior. Because <laughs> you don't say that to someone who's consistent. That's, right. you, that's someone you know is not doing what they're supposed to do, and Amen. you better do what you're supposed to do. But if you think that way, you'll, you'll work that way for the Lord. That's right. Because like, if you're only thinking, like, well, when, you're, so, when your master's watching you and you're thinking, well, only do well when he's watching, that's how you're going to serve Christ. Like, well, that's when you're working for Christ, right? Amen. When he's around, then when he's gone, then you're just working for yourself. I just noticed that <laughs> whatever you give your master, you're giving that same kind of mediocre that's right. work to Christ, and it'll make you inconsistent <laughs> in the service to God. Mm -hmm. Men pleasers. Yeah. Also, servants are exhorted to be obedient to your own masters and please them well in all things. Yet don't do it as a men pleaser. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. How about that? Please them well now in all things. Yeah. But <laughs> don't do it as a men pleaser. The driving compulsion is to make a favorable impression with the men pleaser. That's the driving, make a favorable impression. The driving compulsion for a servant of God is do the best you can. Yeah. Yeah. Completely different yeah. mindset. Not as men pleasers now, but as the servants of Christ. That's how you're doing this. Amen. You say, what does that have to do with being a teller at a bank or being an electrician? or being a truck driver, or being an engineer, being a carpenter. What does being a servant of Christ have to do with that? Everything. Because Jesus bought you. You belong to him. You're his representative on that job you're doing. You're leaving an impression on that job about what people think about people who say they belong to Christ. You're leaving an impression as a servant of Christ, no pretension. We're not pretending to be of, be of serving Christ. We actually are. We're purchased slaves. That's what we are. We do not belong to ourselves. That's the, that's the categorical statement of Scripture. So we have no right to shape our own destiny. We don't. In fact, God puts you where he wants you, and he, sh he shapes you for Amen. his destiny. Yeah. It's his destiny Amen. for you. That is the end. None of us come in with a full knowledge of this. Yes, but I don't remember where I heard this for sure, but someone had mentioned that Paul, being a, a prisoner, said more than once that he was a prisoner of Jesus of Christ. Christ. That's right. And technically speaking, he could have said the prisoner of Rome. Because that's who held him. Yeah. But he didn't. He didn't think that way. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Ephesians six, the whole armor of God. Back then, being a prisoner meant you. Were, he was probably chained to a soldier. And so, he was probably being in proximity to all these.
pieces of armor, yeah. it, it occurred to him, yeah. hey, you know, I've got this armor amen, on too. Amen. And so, but that, that, that's like a, a, a side benefit of that's right. doing all these things as unto the Lord, then you, you actually get fruit from things that otherwise would beat you down. Uh -huh. Amen. Now, I know some of you have learned this by experience. I, I have learned it by experience. That when you when you live like this as a servant of Christ, you you feel better. Yeah, absolutely. The job looks different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're able to put be more creative. Mm -hmm. You just kind of frees you up. Because mm -hmm. the, the spirit of Christ brings liberty, mm -hmm. and liberty applies in these areas here. I mean, if you're approaching your job this way, then you're not going to be hesitant to call it, to call God into situations. That's right. I That's mean, right. You won't, be, you won't have that hindrance there. You, you know you've been doing right. You can, Amen. Yeah. I really good. And I remember a story my mother used to tell about a lady. I can't think of her name. But anyway, you might, you'll might probably know her, and I know Sister Dew might know her. But anyway, she had trouble do, ironing her clothes. And... um. I mean, she had a big family. She had a lot of clothes. Yeah, back when you did ironing. Yeah, yeah when you did ironing. And um, <laughs> so, but it would really back up. And so, but she heard a sermon. I'm taking it. was from mm -hmm. you. On doing this, all things hardly is unto the Lord. And she got into doing that ironing. And my mom said before long, she was taking in other people's ironing. <laughs> Because she saw that this was, she was yeah. doing it for the Lord. Yeah. Amen. And so something that she started out hating... Yeah. She didn't want to do it, but see, it transformed what she did. Yeah. Amen. And and it, I never forgot that, you yeah. know. And 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 no matter what you got to do, my mom used to say, "I'm I'm mopping this floor for the Lord. I'm mopping, yeah. so I'm gonna do a good job." Yeah. But I didn't when I was little. I didn't understand. Yeah. I understand it now. Yeah. Amen. Amen. As the servants of Christ, see the servants of Christ. They're under constant care. He cares for his own. The holy angels are ministering to him all the time. They can go in and out and find pasture, Jesus said. The surroundings are peaceable, pleasant. The city is beautiful for situation. He said, we're, of all the people that can do this, the saints are in a position to do this. To do it joyfully and gladly and might say be a full time Christian. <laughs> as a servant of Christ. See, as I have mentioned, spiritual Babylon has taught people that such a life is is slothful and not lived unto the Lord is acceptable. It may not be the best. They won't say it's the best, but you know how we all are. And, but Paul doesn't allow that kind of thinking. Doing the will of... Remember, he's talking about servants obeying their masters. Doing the will of God, which relates to servants obeying their masters. Doing the will of God from the heart. Or doing the pleasure of the Lord. Or enjoying what you're doing. A deep desire to do what God wants them to do. Lord, help me to help me to do this in a way that will please you. Yeah. And I know if it pleases you, it, it'll be the best. It'll be the best uh, yeah. right. best way to do it. it? Yes. You know, people are talking like this. They're, they're not. They're discouraging striving for excellence. Really, mm -hmm. if, if if the standard is lowered, I, I've seen this a lot at work. Every once in a while, we'll have uh, we go from one order to the next order, and it's the exact same product, but the standard's lower. And you look at it, and and uh, what they do is they say, well, this is all we have to make them. And so from then on, for the rest of the day, the, it'll, the production will actually go down. When then nothing's yeah. changed except for the standard. The standard. That's just the, the way flesh is. That's you know, they'll right. They only do what's required. And there's no Move the bar lower. Then the midgets can high jump too. <laughs> Doing the will of God from the heart. Now that is a 
That's a great blessing and a great privilege and a, and a great work that you can do the will of God from the heart. It's like the will of God sometimes is crucify the flesh, <laughs> mortify your members, deny yourself. He, but from the heart, that's because you want to do it, not because you have to do it. The Lord will say sometimes, he said one time, the only people who will get into the kingdom of heaven are those that do the will of God. And the will of God is such, you have, you have found this out, have you not? The will of God is such, it's got to be done to the heart or you just can't do it. Yeah. You can't do it if you don't do it from the heart. It, it requires the heart and your consent and your love and your in favor and your it, pleasure. And it, it requires all of that to be done. Another time Jesus said, Whosoever shall do the will of God the same is my mother, my brother, my sister, and my mother. Well, that's a good incentive to be, uh, to do the will of God from the heart is on to Christ because he's, then you'll be his brother or sister or mother, and he cares for his own. So the work of God, however, cannot be done perfunctorily or superficially or effortless, effortlessly. It can't be done that way. It's the, work, the will of God by its nature demands the best you have. Yeah, it demands all of your person. It demands all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. By its very nature, the will of God requires this. So now think how reasonable would it be if a large segment of your life, one third of your day, every day was spent doing things without your heart, without your soul, without your mind, without your strength. That would result in spiritual deterioration. So this is a gracious accommodation, actually, to spiritual life. Yes, brother? So I've been thinking about this, doing the will of God from the heart. You're speaking of the job looking differently if you think about it in the context of doing it for Jesus. And it looks the same, it looks different also if the person does a, a job here effortlessly, they don't want to do it, they're doing it because they have to do it. And then you take a believer who's doing the same job, who's working for Christ, they're bringing God yeah. the glory. It, there's a lot of difference even in that because they're putting their soul, mind, and strength into it That's because right. they know that they're, um, it's they're a bringing witness. glory to God. It's yes. a witness. Now the people seeing it may not know that that's why you're doing it. But then again, they may ask you. And you can say, well, being as you asked. <laughs> with good, she'll talk about the service, obeying the master. With good will, doing services to the Lord, not unto men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So now, he introduces God's incentive program. He's going to give you a good reason to do what he said. <laughs> Don't you love this about the Lord? He, he, he doesn't have to do this. He doesn't have to offer some kind of incentive. But he does. He offers an incentive. He made man so that man had an interest in self. Without, so he's going to sanctify the interest in self by offering something for service to him. I'm afraid there are many professing Christians who've not yet devoted the servile portion of their life mm -hmm. to God. Yeah. They don't work for God when they're on a job. They don't think about working for God when they're on the job. They don't think about the witness they leave or the light they're shining or the reproving that could be done through their life. They just don't think about it. So that's why he's writing this, yeah. <laughs> with goodwill doing service. Serve wholeheartedly, one version says. Render service with enthusiasm. New Revised Standard Version. Doing your work readily or without hesitation. Serve eagerly. Willingly serving. Rendering service readily with goodwill. See, now men are fond of talking about free will, right? How about talking about goodwill? I like to talk about goodwill. Now the scripture talks about goodwill. Goodwill. That is, what you want is good. 
What do you want? To serve God. I want to please Christ. I'm acknowledging that I, I belong to him. He bought me. He's got every right to tell me to do what he just told me to do. And I do it with goodwill. Doing service. I, just, I like that expression. Instead of serving, doing service means you enter into it wholeheartedly. Doing service to the Lord, not to men. Some versions say, as if you were serving the Lord. That's the NIV. I don't like the as if. I, I don't like that. That's like you're pretending, you know. I, I'm sure that isn't what they meant, but that's, that's how it could sound. The idea is do it as you're serving. Do the deed as you're in doing it. You're actually serving Christ. You're thinking about Christ. You're thinking about this work I'm doing, passing the inspection of Christ. Yeah. Now we're going to give account for our works, aren't we? Yeah. Some of your works are the ones done between 8 and 5. Mm -hmm. I don't think some people think about this. Because there's every man according to his work shall be judged according to their works. What works? All our works. And the majority of your works, the majority, the vast majority of your works are performed outside the assembly and in the world if you're a, a servant. But you're going to be judged for how you did them. How did you do them? Well or sloppily? It complicates the issue when people come up and they create a Christ that would never condemn them or would never That's right. have any kind of condemnation That's right. towards them. So they, they, they reason it out, well, well, but Christ would receive this inferior work because he loves me so yeah. much. I mean, I've actually had people imply that, that Christ is merciful. Well, my, yeah. my boss is not merciful. Yeah. But see, they're, they've, they've discounted this thing. If you do something with all your might, heartily is unto the Lord, and you do your best, there's... There, well, there are just not a lot of employers that, that would that would be reasonable and not accept that. But when you do something haphazardly and say, well, but, you know, I'm doing it for the Lord, but see, you're really not. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not possible. You won't receive it. You won't receive it. We're faced with the unpleasantry, with unpleasantry and servile relationships, and when we are, the answer is very simple. Adjust your attitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at it differently. Yeah. Look at it, at it as serving Christ. Mm -hmm. huh? To put it in the language of the scripture, take that thought captive. Mm -hmm. Bring every thought into obedience. Yeah. Yeah. See? You've got weapons that can do this now. You've got weapons that will enable you to capture a thought mm -hmm. and bring it into obedience to Christ. Amen. The Lord does not speak of serving him only in a favorable context. Sometimes you're serving him when you're in a prison. Sometimes you're serving him when you're in a boat that's about to crash. Sometimes you're at a beating stake. Sometimes you're in a wilderness by yourself. Sometimes you're in a famine. See, so you don't serve God in like a favorable earthly context. But if you will serve him fervently in what appears to be a difficult circumstance, he will bring resources from the homeland yeah. that will enable you to do good. Amen. Now, I remember this. He said, what, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, this is something that is to be known or grasped by the mind, knowing, knowing whatsoever good thing any man doeth, whatever passes the test of good that God Administers, if it passes that, it's, it's good. If God says, well done, that, that passes the test. If he says it's good, it's good. It may be seemingly insignificant, like offering a cup of water. That may not rank high, you know, in the business journal. But it ranks high in the kingdom because it was done as unto him. It may be going where a leader goes, sends you. Like the, remember that centurion said to Jesus, I call my servant, I say go, and he goes. Yeah, that, that's, that's the doing good. 
that servant who went when the Spanish told him to go, he did good. Or tending a tree, remember the master came and said, why this, this tree is cumbering the ground, it's not producing any fruit, dig it up. The man said, wait, I'm going to do a good work here. Let me dig and dug around it. Let's give it one more year. That was a good work. That was a good work. See, the goodness of the deed is primarily determined by the one who did it. <laughs> Not by the nature of the deed, but the character and motive of the person who did it. If the deed is, was done as unto the Lord and not unto men, it was good. Amen. Well, what about a person that does the deed like that? Let's say he does something good. If he's on working in a workaday world, the business is better because he did it. The boss looks better because he did it, but nobody really sees it or recognizes it. So the person may say, well, if not worth doing it. It's not worth doing it because I don't get the credit for it. He just pass it over. No, no, no. Wait, you're not done yet. Whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord. Yeah. Amen. The Lord will... The Lord will give the compensation for that work. And this would be whether he's a slave or free. Either one. The one who does good willingly as unto the Lord will be duly compensated. I gather the compensation is somehow related to what he to what he did. Now as I say I've I've experienced this, so I know this by experience. With very under very unfavorable circumstances, and I just decided I'm going to work for the Lord, and so I did. I ended up on top of the heap, mm -hmm. without having to do one thing myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for it. I didn't seek it. I couldn't imagine it could happen. I just worked for the Lord, and the Lord did the rest. Yes, amen. Out of the outcome of all that, I was able to retire earlier. I carried with me all my insurance so that the Surgeries that Brother Benjamin had were paid for. But when I retired, we could buy a house and not go in debt. And it all went back yeah. to doing it well yeah. because I was serving Christ. And when I went home at night, I wanted to be able to say, Lord Jesus, thank you for giving me the opportunity for doing that, freeing me up to do it. I give you the thanks for it. And I offer it. And I offer that work I did. I offer it to you now. Is a token of praise. Amen. It seems to me, though, that the focus here is on the day of judgment, actually. That's when all the accounts are going to really be settled. He's going to judge every man according to as his work shall be, or according to their works. Then servants and in our society employees, they'll be summoned before the Lord. He'll cover the time you were employed. Review that work. Oh, you'll be glad then if you did your work unto the Lord. You'll be glad when that time comes. You say, here my Lord, here my, I'm ready. You know I did it for you when I was there. And you'll say, well, who knows? He may, who knows what you'll be made the head of there. Because you proved yourself to be faithful. Now this understanding that we've dealt with tonight transforms how a person works as a subordinate. See, there's no in the world there's no glory to being a subordinate. People strive, do everything, they train, they go to school, they get degrees, they do everything they can, so they're not a subordinate. But it's not all that much of a handicap being a subordinate. You really, really got really have to see it. In fact, some of the Chief men that were elevated in Scripture were first subordinates. So when life is lived unto the Lord, it is lived with Him on the day of judgment in mind. And when you're given the cup of life to drink, it's not near as bitter. Believe me, it's not near as bitter. Now I've drank bitter cups when I had a wrong attitude wrong mindset, drank bitter cups. That is, 
it's good to do something that's difficult to do under difficult circumstances. Do it for the Lord and then drink of the sweet elixir of grace yeah. and find a great refreshing to your soul. Amen. Amen. Now, why is, uh, why is Paul talk like this? Because salvation touches every facet of a person's life. But it is so difficult for this concept to be seen because it's foreign to everything the world says that he, he's lisping to us like in baby talk, showing us how this works. That know wherever you are in life, you can serve God wherever you are. You can serve God. In fact, you must serve God wherever you are from your youth up. And when you do, you're doing more than just like building up points. I mean, you, you are becoming a useful tool in the hands of the Lord. God will be able to trust you with greater things to do. And I encourage you to work on this as much as you can. And then be alert. Keep alert. And you will find that things will take place in your life you never dream possible, and it'll be traced back to this excellent spirit you had in obeying your master as unto Christ. Did any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? <clears throat> yes, Brother Jeremy. Yeah, like you said at the end here, <clears throat> And this isn't just pertaining to this world. The Lord's preparing us for some work that's going to be done on the other side. We don't know what that's going to be, but the, the trials and things that we go through, we do everything unto the Lord, and the Lord stretches us. And he's preparing us for something. That's right. And we don't know what that's going to be, but we, we just want to be faithful in whatever the Lord gives us, not to dig a hole and, and, and throw what the Lord's given us into a hole and to bury it, but to... to take what he's given us and and to uh, do our best with it to prosper because he's going to be coming back looking for what we did with what he gave us and if we're not if we're not faithful we're, we're going to be in trouble but if we are faithful this is what I have, I have personally rejoiced in who but who does really like to work and nobody sees their work nobody likes that but the Lord he he does he does see what we do. Yes, and I, that's always blessed me when I'm working, knowing that the Lord's watching me. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mr. June? <clears throat> and that was pretty much along the same lines. There's a lot of comfort in knowing that uh -huh. the Lord sees. Yeah, Amen. that's right. Amen. Yes, brother Aaron. I'm regularly drawn to the two words that Paul gave. Uh, one is unto the pure, all things are pure. Yeah, amen. And another, the old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Amen. Ne neither one of those things are technical statements. In other words, they're not they're not referring to tangible things. That's right. Because when a person comes into the Lord, all their things, as people commonly think of as like possessions, yeah. they don't all become new. No. And it's ob pretty obvious because you don't get a new body when you believe. Mm -hmm. So all things become new have to do with this. Amen. How, now everything's done by faith. Amen. Everything's done in the light. Mm -hmm. Everything's done to the Lord. Everything's done in newness of spirit. Mm -hmm. That's how all things become new. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now the only, the only way you can learn this is to live by faith, right? Yeah. That's the only way. But if you live by faith, you'll get this lesson. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father,